indicates that shortly before his death, he was turning toward the Catholic Church. Lewis termed himself, quote, very Catholic. Why would he say this? Well, his prayers for the dead, his belief in purgatory, his rejection of a literal resurrection of the body are serious deviations from biblical Christianity. And we're going to go way further on this and how he was tied up with Catholicism. Um, and this is, that was actually from his biography, C.S. Lewis biography, page 234. He even went to a priest for regular confessions. Did you know that? And he received the sacrament of extreme unction on 7 63 Now, I was thinking about giving that sacrament to Doug today, but I, I, I don't know. I, I just wasn't in the mood, but anyway, uh, sorry. Uh, yeah, so he got this sacrament of extreme unction. His contention that some pagans may belong to Christ without knowing it is a very destructive heresy as well. He said that in Mere Christianity. I really, don't you love that title, Mere Christianity? I mean, why, you know, what's not to like about the title? That was on page 176, 177. As his statement was that, quote, Christ fulfills both paganism and Judaism. Did you hear that? Christ, Jesus Christ fulfills both paganism and Judaism? Yes, there's a lot of things in the Old Testament where Jesus Christ is clearly indicated, but the Bible says that the Jews have been blinded in part until the fullness of the Gentiles come in. They don't see it right now. And yes, he does fulfill the Bible, but that Christ fulfills paganism? Whoa, I mean, that's pretty dangerous. He said that on, on Reflections in Psalms, page 129. Lewis believed that we are to become gods. Did you know that? I'm talking on this earth. Not later, on this earth. An apparent affirmation of his the theistic evolution. He also believed that the book of Job is, is unhistorical. He says that on Reflections on Psalms, page 110. I'm going to give you some of these now, but I'm not going to give them all to you later, because there are just too many. Uh, that the Bible contained errors. He said that in the same book on page 110 and 112. And the Bible is not divinely inspired. He said that in the Inklings, page 175. Lewis used profanities, told body stories, and frequently got drunk with his students. That was from um, a citing from World Magazine, 519.90. Now that's well, you know, if you look at you know what he did, that's well known. Christians need to read more critically the abolition of man, the problem of pains, miracles, the great divorce, and God in the dock. These are some of his writings. Now, I, I'm not going to tell you you need to read more, more critically. You shouldn't be reading this junk at all. Stick to the word of God. This is why you very rarely ever hear me recommend a lot of different authors to go read. Because the Bible says, Thus saith the Lord, Cursed be the man that trusteth in man, and that maketh flesh his arm, and whose heart departeth from the Lord. Jeremiah 17.5 Cursed be the man that trusteth in man. Do you know how many people trust in this man? It's, it's, he has a cult following. He not only has a cult following within Christianity, he has a cult following within the occult world. There's all kind of people that are involved in witchcraft and the occult that absolutely say you read C.S. Lewis and you read Tolkien before you go further into this occult thing, whatever you're trying to do. That's well documented as well. We're going to be looking at that more next week. I mean, that's a great that's a great uh, endorsement, isn't it? People that are heavily involved in the occult. Yeah, you got to read C.S. Lewis and Tolkien to understand it, man. I mean, it, it doesn't make any sense. The devil's very good at what he does. C.S. Lewis is a great example of that the devil is very good and very subtle at what he does. The guy that led me to the Lord, um, he gave me a book called En Route to Global Occupation by Gary Ka. Great book. Um, and uh, he was from a, he worked in the UN, and um, it was kind of his testimony about working in there, getting saved, coming out, and his whole experience. <coughs> Well, he also, and he would give those books out, and I think it was a tremendous witnessing tool. But another thing that he was really into was C.S. Lewis. And I remember he was reading, like, he was trying to get me to read, the, it's called the Screwtape Files, the Screwtape Letters or whatever, N another great title. And I don't know if I tried reading it or what, but I just couldn't get into it. I just, 
I couldn't, there was nothing about him that appealed to me, even as a baby Christian. Now, I'm not saying if you've read him that I'm better than, I just never could get into the guy. Um, and then later to find out what he said and what he was into, I'm so glad I didn't. But this, these materials by C.S. Lewis are many, many times given to baby Christians as Christian primer tools on, on the faith. This is the last thing you should be giving to a baby Christian. As a mature Christian, the only reason I would ever say to look at any of this is to expose the man. You've got to be really careful what you're, what you're, especially as a baby Christian. If you corrupt your foundation as a baby Christian, the Bible says if the foundations be destroyed, what can the righteous do? Psalm 11 verse 3. You don't want your foundation corrupted from the get-go. But unfortunately, that's a big problem with Christianity today, or what is called Christianity. Because, you know, they supposedly get saved, and, and maybe it's e easy believism. They say some little prayer, and they think that, that they're all good. And then their lukewarm pastor, or whoever, who's a hireling most of the time, and, not, and not, does, has no true love for the sheep, but he's doing it for the money, because he's a hireling. He's in some 501c3 corporation, which he calls a church. I could go on and on about all that. They get him to read this stuff. Instead of going to the King James Bible and putting that into their system, they're putting spiritual junk food into their body by reading all these commentaries and things like that. Now, I'm not saying all commentaries are bad, but I'm saying you really need to rely on the Word of God. I always go back to the Word of God. Period. That, And that's why I don't label myself under any, any denominational say I'm just I call myself a Bible believing Christian that's it born again Bible believing Christian go to the word of God that is how you build your faith okay faith cometh by hearing hearing by the word of God without faith it is impossible to please God faith is how we get saved for you're saved by grace through faith and that not of yourselves it is the gift of God not of works lest any man should boast so we want to really be careful what we're putting in uh, what we're reading and, and these types of things, especially if it has a a spiritual uh, bent to it, like all of C.S. Lewis' writings do. It's very, very dangerous, this stuff. Now, for example, Lewis never believed in a literal hell, but instead he believed hell was a state of mind one chooses to possess and become. Every shutting up of the creature within the dungeon of his own mind is, in the end, hell. That's from The Great Divorce, page 65. These are different books that he wrote. So again, he didn't believe in a literal hell. He believed in purgatory. He, we're going to see he believed in prayers to the dead. He went to auricular confession. Uh, he believed in all the, the, the sacraments that the Catholics and the Anglicans and these types of things. We're going to look at all this stuff. It's unbelievable what this guy was involved with. And yet today he's revered. If it is true to say that you are what you eat, then it is also true to say that a Christian is what he hears and reads. Well, that's, that's true. As a man thinketh, so is he. That's what the Bible says. As a man thinketh, so is he. Okay? The Bible also says there is a way which seemeth right unto a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. So, we've got to really be careful what we're, what we're uh, embracing here. Thus, if Christians are brought up on a diet of C.S. Lewis, it should be no surprise to us to find that they are seeking to continue the legacy of C.S. Lewis. And this is what I really see a lot in you know, the modern day Christian movements. The Apostle Paul said, A little leaven leaveneth the whole lump. Leaven is always a type of sin. Well, his writings had so much leaven in them, how could it not affect you spiritually if you read it? And yet the man is so revered. There was a guy recently up on Sermons Audio, and I noticed that he had this, this, this teaching on C.S. Lewis. And I had never seen him. He was in the top 50, and he was there like every day. So I clicked into it, and I started listening to it, and it was about, I don't know, kind of just going on about... Uh, C.S. Lewis, and he was in a car thinking about something, and he had took this trip, and it was fluff. 
it got nothing into what we're going to be getting into today, which is straight from his own writings. It was glorifying the man. And I went, I, one thing I thought was interesting is I went up to his site, and he had several hundred teachings up on the internet. Most of them didn't even have 50 downloads for the teachings, because you can see if they had, what kind of downloads they had. But this one thing on C.S. Lewis, I think it had three to 4,000, maybe more downloads. And I thought to myself, is this an indication of the priority levels of Christians where they will flock to hear anything about this apostate C.S. Lewis and, and all this other guy's teachings had no hardly any downloads at all. But this one he had three to 4,000. That was one of the reasons I ended up doing this because I realized how, how seriously many Christians take the subject with C.S. Lewis. So if we go further... Thus, if the evangelicals read and applaud such books as mere Christianity, it should come as no surprise if we find them working towards a common mission with the enemies of the gospel. It's a very good point. If we are into these books that people that are actually into witchcraft also applaud, aren't we on some level working toward a common denominator with the pagan religions, with other people that have nothing to do with Christianity? Sure we are. This is these books and, and his writings and these movies are going to be are are and are going to be and have been a major tool of Satan to bring us toward not only a one world religion, but the embracing of witchcraft. Witchcraft is going to be the religion, the essence of the one world religion that we're moving into. The Bible says in Daniel that when the Antichrist arises, he will cause craft to prosper in his hand. He will be a speaker of dark sentences. This is going to be the essence of the one world religion, witchcraft. I mean, hey, if you were the Antichrist, wouldn't that logically be where you would try to get us to? I mean, would it just be like pseudo-Christianity? Would you be content with that if you were the Antichrist? Or would you, at some level manipulate and manipulate until you got us to the point where we were flat out, but basically the whole world is practicing witchcraft. And it's going to be done under the guise, most likely, of the New Age type of witchcraft, which is going to come like white witchcraft. It's good witchcraft. And much of C.S. Lewis' writings are presented that way. You have the white witchcraft and you have the bad. The black. And it's the white against the black. And the white's good. And the black's bad. It's good against evil. See, this is the deception that, that this thread that runs through his writings is so prevalent. The young Christian should be careful what he reads. In these positions, those in positions of authority, pastors, teachers, parents, should be careful what they recommend others to read. And I, I totally agree. We're responsible for that. To whom much is given, much is required. I mean, if, if the Bible says that, it, uh, Jesus said, if you offend one of these little ones that believe in me, it is better than a mill. I mean, what if, you, what if you have a whole bunch of kids and you're having leading some Bible study? For, for example, and you have these kids, and they're Christians or whatever in your church, and you say, hey, kiddies, what I'm going to do is I'm going to loan out these books on C.S. Lewis, and these are really, really good for you to read, and you'll like them, because they're, they're, they're like kind of like Harry Potter, but it doesn't have all the overt witchcraft, even though this was the, essentially the beginnings of Harry Potter, this type of writings, and they go back and they read this, and it's this fantasy slash almost occult thing you're reading, and they get enamored with this, and they get all these unbiblical notions in their head, and the Bible becomes boring, the Word of God doesn't take preeminence anymore, and they get off into all this stuff. What have you done? You've caused them to fall away from the faith. You've, you've led them down the road to hell, or you're leading them. You're pointing them in that direction. You're not pointing them to the Word of God at all. So, you're going to be responsible for that. Jesus said that it would be better for they that offend these little ones that believe in me that if a millstone were hung about his neck and he were cast into the midst of the sea. This is a very serious issue. It is difficult to attempt to evaluate the theology of a man regarded by many as the greatest contemporary lay writer for the Christian faith. With his witty English humor, sharp and sim simple logic, and seeming